Well, I was not in Twin Peaks or involved with it, though the first of David's films that I remixed in 5.1 for their DVD release was Twin Peaks Firewalk with me. And that was in 1999, I think, and uh, for New Line Cinema. And I caught hell for years about the pink room scene because most people had only seen it on VHS, which is a highly audio compressed format. And the dialogue was pushed way down into the music and effects, and uh, then the subtitles. And uh, uh, I, I was under instruction to match the two track theatrical mix except to spread it out. And I was on a 10% rule. David said you can't put more than 10% of the song in the surrounds because it will distract from the picture. And uh, uh, the only thing I was ever able to break him out of that was in a uh, uh, straight story where the car drives through the theater. But, and when Alvin is in this middle of these big trucks and I had the trucks all around him. But uh, other than that, he didn't like surround. He actually wished he could mix in mono. And uh, so I had the guide track transferred from the magnetic film two-track master of Twin Peaks Firewalk with me. And I had to keep referring to that. And David would come up. He was in his office most of the time, and I'd work all day. And he'd come up and check what I did. And then he'd always have me put up the two-track and then the surround mix. And he'd either say, no, that's too much in the surrounds, or, you know, whatever. And, uh, uh, but I remember specifically the pink room scene. He really loved it. And, uh, but when the, when the thing came out on DVD, you folks and all of your kindred gave me hell about being able to understand the dialogue in that scene. And, and I said, it's no different. It's the exact same volume as its counterpart in the stereo mix, but now you have a specific center channel dialogue speaker, and the music and effects are out here, and the dialogue is here, and you can hear it better. And uh, it was quite a controversy at the time. But, uh, uh, and, and I had to defend it for a number of years. But in truth, the science is it's exactly the same as the two-track theatrical mix, but most people had never seen it in the theater. They'd only had the VHS tapes, and that was very misleading. Anyways, David was my client before I worked for him. I had a technical design firm. I built studios all over the world, and David was a client. And I was designing the whole technical end of his studio, implementing it, buying the gear, having it installed, designing the wiring loom and all that stuff. And he had just wrapped Lost Highway. And the Madison house from Lost Highway became the studio. And as soon as they were done shooting and they had, they didn't have a lock on the picture yet, but they knew they didn't have any more pickup shots to do we knocked down about 75% of that house and rebuilt it as the recording studio with David's painting studio on top. Uh, so I remember one bitter cold February day in 97, right about the time of the cast and crew screening, which I did not go to for Lost Highway, I wish I had. But uh, we're sitting on the cement in the dirt of what was to be the studio. And uh, he first brought up that I should maybe be involved in the studio, and I, I just I dismissed it. Then, in August of 97, he had shot a Honda Passport commercial uh, where this person walks up from an L.A. subway station under a full moon, sees this Honda Passport revolving on a turntable, and morphs into a mountain man. And it became the longest running car commercial in television history. Most car commercials run uh, roughly 10 weeks. This ran nine months. It started in the New Year's uh, uh, World Series of uh, 97 and ran until June of 98. And there wasn't a single word of narration in it. And 
the night we mixed it, the studio wasn't done. And I was still installing gear, so I had to put a, a three-quarter inch tape deck on the back of the credenza, which had some gear in it, but a bunch of holes, run cables over the floor, back to the video projector, and up to the sound amplifiers and all that stuff. It was an absolute mess. And then uh, uh, he had ordered up some Foley uh, uh, for the thing, and the footsteps of the guy coming up out of the subway were on wood, and it was obviously cement. So we had some little uh, area behind the console of cement so we could zip our chairs around on. I was wearing dress shoes that night, and I said, just a minute. I went and got a microphone, stuck it next to, the, next to my feet, and I walked it. And, uh, uh, and then, then we had to correct Foley for the spot. And that night he goes, you know, you're the only one that knows how this studio works. You're going to have to run it. <laughs> and I said, I can't afford the pay cut. And Monday morning, I resumed the install of the studio, still a couple weeks away from being finished. And about a week later, I mean, I've really enjoyed my career behind the console, pushing faders and playing with knobs. And uh, about a week later, I realized he's not going to ask that again. That window, it, your life is a one-way hallway, and you pass windows and doors, and they open or they don't and you can choose to partake of an episode, but you can't come back to it. And so I said, I said, well, what are you talking about money-wise anyway? And so we, went, we had lunch in the, in the studio building there. His assistant used to bring us lunch every day. And, uh, and he mentioned a figure which was about, it was less than half of what I was currently earning. I said, oh, man, I can't do that. It's like, I got a family, I got a house, blah, 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 blah. And so he said, well, you know, I, I pay Alfredo, the guy that has built his whole complex by hand, that amount, and he does the work of 10 men. And I went, okay, fine. I'll just continue designing studios. And uh, a day or two later, he comes back and he ups the offer by 50%. It was still a cut, but it was a cut I could live with. And so I went for it. And... Uh, uh, it became such a wonderful, wonderful time in my life. I had come out of a studio in Maui with Walter Becker from Steely Dan, and, and as Walter said, we did Donald Fagan's Comic Period album, three years for eight songs. And uh, uh, as he said, Donald slices a finer pair. So I came out of the Steely Dan school of finer finishing into David Lynch land, where David throws a lot of stuff at the wall and whatever sticks, that's what you work with. And, and so he's a very improvisational person. And the first thing we did was this album called Lux Vivens for Jocelyn Montgomery. It was the 12th century, 1100s uh, 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 mystic nun who had visions and wrote music. And she invented the staff. She used the lines of the hand as the staff lines and would point to the nuns what note to sing. And uh, uh, so, so this woman came in and recorded the uh, vocals against the drone, and then David and I removed the drone and built this whole cinematic, it's a movie without the picture, that album. And we had so much fun doing it that when we were done, he said, let's keep going on, let's keep experimenting, let's keep making music. And that was the genesis of Bluebot. And we started from then on out, and it was a wonderful, wonderful time. Ha, ha, ha.